A um, little word about the Archive Society, first of all, if I may. Um, the Society was started, uh, I think, in 1971. Uh, locally in Cromford, they had a 200 years celebration <coughs> for the anniversary of the establishment of the first cotton mill in Cromford. And uh, the committee that set up and looked after the celebrations stayed on afterwards and decided to devote themselves to um, conserving the remains of the buildings that were left in Cromford. At the time, the buildings that were there were in a terrible state. It was quite a large complex of buildings, but it was, if you imagine one of the sort of sites in Sheffield which has been abandoned after the steelworks collapsed, it was something like that. It had only been used as a cotton mill for quite a short period, and then the buildings were reused for all sorts of different purposes over the years, including most, uh, most recently as a colour works, where they were grinding pigments to make paints. So all the buildings were heavily contaminated with uh, lead chromate and all sorts of nasty chemicals. And there were all sorts of ancillary buildings all over the site that shouldn't have been there. So when the Archive Society took over the sites of Comfort, they spent a, lot, a long time and a lot of money just stabilising the buildings, clearing out what shouldn't be there, and sort of stabilising the buildings, making them secure, and then um, that's kind of the stage they're at now. It's taken 40 years to get that far, and now they're trying to bring the buildings back into use in a sustainable way. It hasn't been achieved yet. Um, the Society is a registered charity. Um, it employs about 40 people, uh, mostly part-time, just very few full-time staff. But it does also rely on volunteers to get the work done. We have about 200 volunteers regularly that help at the site. Everything from uh, running the shops to um, building steps on the land and things like this. So it's, um, although it's not s sustainable financially yet, it does still rely on grants coming in. It's a very vibrant place with lots of things happening. And uh, we've got lots of big projects going on. And we keep looking forward to the day when it's going to be sustainable and we won't have, be having to bring money in every year to keep it going. That's the long-term ambition. So, Richard Arkwright. Um, very interesting character because when you think about rags to riches stories, they don't become much better than Richard Arkwright. He died in nine, uh, 1792 at the age of 59. When he died, he was a knight of the realm. He was, we had just been High Sheriff of Derbyshire. His income, his annual income, was greater than most German principalities. He could have paid off the national debt personally, just from the fortune that he had amassed. And yet, 20 years before he died, he was virtually penniless. So everything he achieved was in the last 20 years of his life. Just about, just 21, 22 years. He was born in um, 1732, 23rd December, in Preston in Lancashire, to a poor family uh, with many children, and he was one of the last children to be born. So he didn't get off to a very good start, really. Um, he had no formal education of any sort. He had no training, he had no experience with working with machinery. So his later achievements were all the more remarkable because of that. As soon as he was old enough, he was apprenticed out to become a barber. Um, now we think sometimes historically of barbers as being barber surgeons, but at this time, the Barbers Guild and the Surgeons Guild had actually separated. So surgeons were now looking after anything that was medical, Barbers were sort of reduced to looking after cutting people's hair. So they had lost a lot of their status, lost their prestige. So the, the industry he came into was a very low rank industry. Barber shops were frequented by people of quite low social status at the time. They were seen as being very unsanitary places. So, you know, things at this stage were still not looking very good for his right? He completed his apprenticeship at the age of about 18 and went to work for another barber in Bolton in Lancashire. Um, and 
After his master died, he continued working there for some time for his master's uh, widow. He stayed there. Eventually, he managed to set up his own barber's business at, um, uh, in Bolton, in Lancashire. And uh, around about this time, there was a slight upturn in the fortune of barbers. It became very fashionable for men in particular to wear wigs. And uh, these were very, um, well, everybody wore them, whether they got a full head of hair or not. It was just a fashion to wear them. And barbers got the job of making these wigs and maintaining them. They took quite a lot of looking after. So suddenly there was a bit of an increase in the, the want for barbers. So he was doing a little better. Uh, he set up his own business and for a while was reasonably successful. There's uh, even one of his business cards has survived from the time. Unfortunately, it's not, not a very good uh, <laughs> picture, but that's one of Richard Arkwright's business cards from when he was a barber. Um, in 1755, when he was now about 23, he married. He married a, a lady called Patience Holt from Bolton, and she bore him his only son, Richard, also Richard, on the 19th of December of the same year that he married. <clears throat> and for a while things went quite well for them, but two years later, sadly, patients died. And at that time, um, Richard Arkwright's business, for one reason or another, went downhill quite quickly. It is known that he was not well at the time, he had very severe asthma. So whether that was played a part in the business going downhill, I don't really know. But he was left at the time with a business that wasn't working, with a young child, and he'd lost his wife. Um, he what little money he had left, he seemed to invest in trying to run a public house, and he failed at that. He invested too much money. Um, he spent money on the decorations and refurbishing the building, and he didn't get it back, so he was penniless. And eventually he had to leave Bolton, uh, probably in debt, and sort of run away from it all. So by the end of the 1950s, when he was about 28 years old, he had no property, no business, he'd lost his wife, and he had a young child to look after. So things that started badly had really sort of continued on a downhill course for him. The next thing that's known about him is three years later, he married a second time. <clears throat> he married uh, Margaret Biggins from Lee, and it appears there's, there's a good possibility that he actually married Margaret Biggins for her money. Uh, they certainly didn't seem to have a very good relationship together. Eventually he did leave her later on. Um, but she did have a little money which he was able to invest in starting a new business. Uh, they had a daughter, Susanna, quite early on. And I think there were some more children. As far as I could tell, they all died in infancy. I think Susanna was the only one to survive from that marriage. Uh, his new business was um, making wigs he was travelling around the countryside and buying hair to make the wigs. <clears throat> so he, he uh, went from town to town to travelling fairs and persuaded people to have their hair cut and bought the hair from them to make into wigs. He also, um, somehow he, he came upon a process for dyeing the hair. We don't know whether he invented that or whether he attained it from somebody else, but he learned how to dye hair which enabled him to sell the hair to other wig makers and uh, he started, but this was the first time he'd shown his uh, prowess for business and his business acumen started making more money by selling the hair to other people. Um, and then things started going wrong again because the fashion for wigs was coming to an end and there was less demand for the hair. So again, things were not looking too good but about this time, he met two people who had a central part in the rest of his life. Uh, two men from um, Lee, which is where his wife came from, and they were Thomas Hayes, who was a reed maker, and John Kay, a clock maker. And these two men together were trying to make a machine to spin cotton. The involvement of a clock maker is significant because at the time, Clockmakers were the only people who really understood how to make gears. They would cut gears themselves from metal wheels. So um, the involvement of a clockmaker 
uh, provided the technical background for the process they were looking into. At that time, cotton spinning uh, had not progressed really in England in the last 400 years. The cotton industry was um, growing in England. Cotton was coming in, and there was a great demand for it. Although there was opposition from the woolen industry, cotton was in demand, and there was the potential for great growth. And most parts of the cotton process, cotton making process, could be mechanized, but spinning was the bottleneck in the process. Um, just to run through the process of making cotton, in case anybody's not familiar with it, I grabbed this from, come from Mill when I came out this morning. This is raw cotton as it arrived in this country, just as it comes from the plants. It's not been uh, put into any sort of order, it's still just a bunch of fibres. It still contains bits of husks and um, debris from the plants from when it was picked. The basic processes to turn this into cotton um, into cotton cloth started with picking out various bits of debris from it, which had to be done by hand. Then it was uh, carded, which meant getting um, two leather-backed cards with pins sticking through them, a bit like um, combs that people use for dogs today to get the hair out of them. And the cotton was put onto one of these cards, and then with the other one, the two were scraped against each other and all the fibres would be pulled into the same direction. And then it would be taken off and the fibres would be rolled out into a long, loose, a long, loose thread called roving. And this is a piece of roving here. So this is the next stage. The cotton is now all lined up, all the fibres are lined up. It's not been twisted together and although it's quite thick, it has no strength at all because the fibres are only held together by friction. So, when someone was going to spin the cotton, this is what they started with, the roving on a big spindle or a big spool. And the process was still done... Oh, sorry, those were the two gentlemen mm -hmm. at uh, Arkwright met, Mr. Hayes and Mr. Kay. Um, yes, this was the basic spinning process. Uh, a large wheel, which just provided, uh, it was like a flywheel really. The important part is the spindle that you see sticking out from the sides. On the lady's lap, she's got a bundle of roving. She pulls the roving off with her hands to pull the fibres out into a thinner piece of roving. Um, she uses the turning motion of the spindle to help pull it out, and then she allows the the, uh, the, the, the thread that she's made to spin onto the spindle, putting a twist in it at the same time, and that's what provides its strength. And that's what creates the thread that can be used for weaving. But it was all being done in this very slow way, by hand, by single people, mostly working at home. Um, and when somebody wanted to do some weaving, they had to go, they had to walk miles around all the different spinners buying spun thread from them. <clears throat> they were not centralised in any way, they were scattered all over the place. Um, the quality of the yarn that they got from the spinners varied enormously depending on how skilled they were. Often it had lumps in it, uh, it might have breaks in it, so it wasn't always very good quality. Um, and you can see that this was slowing down the whole process and many people were looking for a way to speed up the spinning. And this had been going on for some time. Lots of people had tried, but the majority of them were trying to find a way to emulate what the spinners were doing by hand. Um, and this was not being very successful, because it's a very difficult process to copy by machine. It is a very skilled process. So. The three of them together, including Arkwrights, tried to use uh, a machine like this one. This is actually the one that Arkwright um, took with him when he first applied for his patent for the machine. This is the first frame that they used. Um, you can see it's got four threads being produced on it. It comes down from the roving at the back of the machine 
and then the thread is pulled by rotating rollers. So this is not trying to do what a woman's doing with a hand, it's using rollers which are driven by a belt and the rollers are pulling out the roving to stretch the fibres out. So we're starting with this and it's being stretched thinner and thinner until it's the correct thickness. The tricky bit is getting the spinning rollers to spin at the right pace. And there are actually two pairs of rollers in this machine. The first pair started pulling it out, the second pair rotated slightly faster and pulled it out finer. And then finally, down at the bottom of the machine, there's a rotating flyer which puts the twist into it before it's bound, um, wound onto a spindle. So this machine is using pairs of rollers and a rotating flyer. Other people have tried this, and uh, Highs and uh, uh, what was it name again? His name escapes me. Highs and K had actually tried to perfect this machine themselves, but Arkwright was the one that perfected it. I don't quite know how he managed that, whether he stole the idea from somebody else or whether he invented it himself. He certainly had a mind that was good for inventing because he invented things later on. The, the improvements that Arkwright included in the machine were two things specifically. The first one was getting the rollers the correct distance apart. It's very crucial to have them just the right distance so that when the threads are pulled, they still overlap each other by about, I think it's by about two thirds. Any further than that, and you risk the thread pulling to pieces, uh, any less than that, and you're not making a thin enough thread. So he was able to work out just the correct distance to have the, the rollers apart for the cotton. It's difficult with cotton because the threads are so short, it's difficult to judge. The second thing he added to the machine was weighting the rollers with heavy lead weights, so they pressed together very hard. This hadn't been done before, this is something he added to it. Um, and they found that this machine actually worked. At this stage it was hand driven and it was producing four threads of cotton. But the cotton it produced was consistent. This was an important thing. Uh, it was good quality, it could be used for weaving straight off this machine. <clears throat> because they could do four threads, there was no reason why they couldn't expand that and do eight, sixteen, as many as they wanted, providing they had the power to make the machine work and someone to look after it, it could be multiplied as many times as you wanted. The other great thing was it did not require any skill to work it. So the person they employed to work it could be unskilled and therefore didn't have to be paid very much. So it had great advantages. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure I had another. Oh, yes, this was. Um, the machine they ended up with, it's just exactly the same thing, but a larger version. Forget how many uh, threads this one has on it, it's around about 100. Now, this is actually a picture of one of the machines that came from Cronkill Mill later on. This one is in the museum at Helmshaw in Lancashire, if you get a chance to go and see it. It's one of the original uh, water frame machines. <clears throat> you can see the big heavy lead weights there, in the middle of it, hanging down, which weights the rollers. Um, Arkwright, by this time, was 36 years old when he managed to get the patent on this machine. Um, so we're approaching the time when he started to make his fortune. He knew the potential of the machine and uh, he knew it could replace spinning that was going on in cottages in a central factory, but he didn't have the money to set up a factory on his own. He still had no money at all, really. So he went into partnership with two people uh, John Smalley, a publican and paint merchant from Preston, and David Thornley, who was a merchant from Liverpool. And the three of them together set up business in Nottingham, first of all, with um, a factory that was powered by horses. So a horse would be going round and round a capstan, providing the power for the machines. And it's, it started to work, they were getting somewhere, but they ran out of money again by 1770. So they brought in two more partners, uh, Samuel Need and Jeremiah Strutt, and the machine at uh, Nottingham persuaded the new partners to invest in a new factory at Cromford. Now, 
Why Cromford? Well, Arkwright had lived for a while at Worksworth, which is just up the road from Cromford, so he was aware of the place. But it, Cromford had certain advantages that made him want to go there. First of all, there was um, a good supply of water. It's a steep-sided valley in Cromford, <clears throat> and there are plenty of streams running through it, besides the main river itself. The one that particularly attracted Arkwright was a drain that came out from a lead mine, because the previous industry in the village was lead mining. That's what all the people who lived there were still doing. And to drain the lead mines, tunnels had been uh, channeled into the hillside, locally known as suffs. And the suffs went into the hillside and brought all the water out from the lead mines so the mines could go deeper. Now the water that came out was very constant over the year. It didn't vary a lot. And it all ran into one big suff in Cromford, known as Cromford Suff. And uh, the water that came out was constant. And the other thing was it didn't freeze in the winter because it was coming from underground and it was slightly warmed. And it provided a source of water that could be relied on all through the year. So <clears throat> Arkwright was aware of this, and that was one of the reasons he came to Cromford. Another one was that um, a piece of land became available there to rent at a good price. So there was some chance in the fact that he came to Cromford. It wasn't all because it was the perfect place to come to. Uh, he knew it, there was land there, there was water. Um, and what he did was he actually rented some land, he bought a building it works with, demolished it, took all the stone down to Cromford and built the first mill. He was in such a hurry to do it, he didn't want to wait for stone to be quarried, he knocked a building down, used the stone and built the first mill. This was 1771. This was a large building, it was five stories tall and it was large enough so in width it would hold these machines that you see in front of you. These went across the base of the mill, uh, row upon row of them, all the way down the mill. <coughs> Excuse me. Five storeys tall, it's possible that on the upper storeys um, the other processes were, were taking place. So the cotton would arrive in its raw state at the factory, go up to the top, and they would do the picking out, the carding, create the roving, and on the lower floors they did the spinning. And uh, Arkwright brought people in from all over the place to work in the mill because, there were, as I say, in Cromford there were only a few farmers and lead miners. He, he employed them to come into the factory and work as unskilled labour, but he brought in clockmakers from Derby to build the machines, to cut all the gears for them, to build the water wheels, to power the machinery and so on. <coughs> um, the, the factory made cotton very successfully and it was being sold mostly in the north of England and at the time, as I mentioned before, the woolen industry was still opposing the cotton industry because the woolen industry was much more established and uh, the woolen industry had managed to, to make it so there was a duty to be paid on cotton and cotton fabric. And, um, Cotton fabric that Arkwright was producing actually attracted quite a high levy of sixpence. I'm not sure how, how much that was for, but it was sixpence duty to be paid. But by selling it in the north of England, Arkwright was getting away with those sixpence. <coughs> now, at some point, a challenge came to this from the, the woolen industry down in London. <coughs> and Arkwright had to go down to London to defend his position and try and get the duty lowered. He succeeded in doing this because he proved he'd been successful. I think perhaps if he'd gone down immediately when they started the factory, he might not have got away with it. But because he'd been making money for a few years, and other people had been making money too, they backed him and said, look, we're all doing very well out of this, it's a good business. We wanted to lower the duty, and it was lowered. So from that point onwards, Arkwright could compete with the woolen industry. And that was possibly one of the most significant things he achieved <clears throat> because it, uh, it changed the balance of the two industries in the country. Um, within five years, the mill was employing 500 people, 24 hours a day, six days a week. They worked in two 12 hour shifts or maybe 13 hours overlapping. At night time, they prepared the cotton and daytime they spun it. So at night time, the, candle, the, the factory was candle lit and lamp lit. 
So it must have been quite a strange sight for people in the 1770s to see this massive five-storey building, candlelit, working 24 hours a day. Um, conditions for the workers were, I think we can say, reasonable. Compared to what they were doing before, working down the lead mines, um, they were probably better off. Lead mining was a very, very dangerous industry, particularly when they were crushing the lead and smelting it, which was done on a small scale. <coughs> it's extremely poisonous. And there were also lots of accidents down the mines themselves. So people were quite willing to come and work at the mills. After all, they were working indoors. The mills were heated. Um, that was for the cotton rather than the workers, because it made it less brittle. Um, they even had toilets in the mills, which was quite unheard of. But Arkwright looked after his workers fairly well because he knew that by looking after them, they were more productive. He wasn't really a particularly generous man. In fact, he didn't seem to be generous at all. But he did look after the workers to make them more productive. This is the, the first mill as it appeared a few years later. So it's quite an impressive building, as you can see. Um, and the other buildings on the site were all built very rapidly within the next few years. So this was 1771. By 1776, the second mill had been built on the same site. This was a seven-story building, a massive building. It had a great water wheel actually inside it. And of course, it was using the same water that powered the first mill. It's only about 100 yards away from it. And the great thing about water power, of course, is that you can use it again and again and again, provided you've got a fall of water, which they had on site. <clears throat> so this was all set up within a very few years, and it was making a tremendous amount of money. Um, over those first few years, the technical problems were ironed out, and uh, the whole process was put together making cotton yarn from raw cotton all the way through with very few problems. Um, Arkwright was inventing the first production line in a factory. This was really the first time all these processes had been brought together in one place. And this is one of the main things that he left us. Arkwright built houses for his workers in the village. He built shops for them, uh, churches, pubs, the whole community was built by Arkwright for the workers. Um, he made sure he got the money back because he paid his workers in tokens that they spent in his shops. So he got the money back again and just kept it all going. <laughs> he was a businessman. Um, he liked to employ women and children. He paid them less and uh, they could do the work. It was mainly unskilled work, so it wasn't a problem. The men tended to be at home, still looking after their lead mines and doing a bit of weaving as well. Most of the cottages in Cronford have got the, uh, the, up, the third floor and most of them has the extra windows in so they could have a weaving loom on the top floor and the men could be there working with decent light at home. So within a few years, he was getting quite a wealthy man. Uh, he bought land all around Cronford and with that came the lordship of the manor. So he became a lord of the manor. He kept a carriage. He had servants. Uh, he purchased an estate worth £20,000. He, from about 1780 onwards, so within 10 years, he put most of his efforts into uh, investing his money in other people's mills. So he was helping other people get started doing what he had done so successfully. And because he still had the patents, other people, when they set their mills up, were paying him license money to use the same process. <clears throat> so he was reinvesting all his profits in different mills around the country. And this is where most of his eventual fortune came from. Not the actual production of cotton, but getting other people to license his uh, production system. Um, it's known that uh, one of the things he did was to loan money out to aristocracy. He made a secret loan of £5,000 to Georgina, the Duchess of Devonshire, um, to pay off her gambling debts. And it took a long time for that money to come back. But, uh, that money was eventually paid back after his death to his son. His son um, 
made his greater fortune by concentrating on being a banker. That's what he went into. So Arkwright Sr. gradually bought land around Cromford. He built a Gothic mansion up on the hillside behind a mill. Um, this was called Willersley Castle. Built this to live in, although he actually died before it was completed. The building is still there. It actually burnt down uh, while it was being built and they had to start again and rebuild it. But uh, it's now a hotel in Cromford. Uh, it's amazing that when you are at the castle looking out towards the mill, you can't see it. It's totally hidden by the big rock that's on the right of the picture there, which is a, a huge lump of limestone. The mills are just on the inside of it. But from the castle, you see nothing. Uh, you can't see that. You can't see massive mill that he built around the corner. So although he was within half a mile of his mills, there was no way of being uh, bothered by the noise or, or the, having to watch the workers go back and forth or any of that unsavoury business. Um, he went to the extent of uh, having, on the hillside up above, going away from here, all the walls that ran across the hillside um, are banked up with grass to form haw-haws, as they call them. So from the castle, you can't, you can't even see the stone walls, all you see is a green hillside. So he was very conscious of uh, making an impression for people that came to stay with him at the castle. He made it as grand as he possibly could. I think many people thought he went way over the top, and it was all quite vulgar. Um, but anyway, it's still there, and it's still very nice today. Um, he was made High Sheriff in 1787. Uh, he made a huge show of wealth when he was conducting official business as sheriff. He was knighted for presenting a loyal address to King George III. <clears throat> he also married later a third time. Um, he achieved social acceptability. He was well respected by fellow industrialists, um, such as Josiah Wedgwood. Wedgwood. He thought he was a, a very wonderful man. But he was consumed with his mills and the uh, processes and the machines. Other people found him a very boring conversationalist because all he spoke about was machines and business. Uh, he was famously described as being a plain, almost gross, bag cheeked pot belly Lancashire man. But whatever the case, the legacy he left us was enough for the Victorians to call him the father of the Industrial Revolution. Um, his, that's where is the castle today, as it is as a hotel. His achievements um, sort of fall into three categories. His immediate achievements, where he made a great deal of money, which was what he wanted to do in the first place. He took uh, credit for inventing a lot of the machinery, although he took advice from other people on that. He brought in the production line factory. He brought in the factory community which other people copied around the country afterwards. Um, indirectly, he created great wealth in uh, Lancashire, where the cotton industry moved to, um, and great wealth for the whole country. The country did very well out of the cotton industry for decades afterwards. Um, industrial development followed after that because of the money it was created, so this all sort of goes back to our right? And in the long term, um, he certainly played a large part in the urbanisation of this country by showing that work could be centralised rather than being scattered around in people's homes. Um, which is quite ironic because if you come to Cromford and have a look around, it's, it's not urbanised at all. It's, it's kind of stayed as it was 200 years ago, with the exception of the new road going through. It's still very much as it was. And uh, I do hope that you'll come down to Cromford sometime and see us down there and we can show you around and tell you more about it. Thank you very much. Fashion. Uh, well, um, he possibly was, actually. Oh. I mean, I don't think he kept up with fashions at all. He, he was probably right. 20 years behind everybody else anyway. Oh, right. But um, there, are, there are pictures of other people wearing wigs at the time. So, although it was declining, I think you know, wigs were still warm. It's interesting that when he was a wig maker, that was probably his first experience of working with fibres. Yeah. So later on, you know, he probably applied some of that knowledge to the costume industry. And of course, in wig making, they would have been doing some weaving as well. To make the bases for them. Yes, I guess so, yeah. I see we have a visit planned to Comfort Meal on I believe so, yes. 29th of June, the day you have a beer festival. 
Oh, oh is it? Mm. <laughs> that might be in, in that connection because if Tom Brewer is exhibiting that day, they made India Pay Lane, IPA. So that's, that's India connection there. Okay, oh. excellent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't aware it was the same day, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Although Arkwright never managed to enjoy the wonderful uh, Gothic uh, mansion that he built, presumably his son lived there? His son did, yes. His son stayed there. And were you um, suggesting his son was a big name in banking? His son made more money than the father, actually, through banking. <clears throat> but, uh, and of course, there was a daughter as well, Susanna. Um, it's interesting that she married local aristocracy. Uh, Charles Hurt. And the Hurt family is a very old local family, still there today, uh, around uh, that part of Derbyshire. So she became a member of the Hurt family. Uh, her husband, Charles Hurt, and Richard Arkwright Jr. were responsible for planting all the trees that are in the lower Derwent Valley. Um, all the trees have been cleared off the slopes of the valley um, to make charcoal for the lead mining industry previously. And those two together replanted all the trees, and today it's it's a very wooded area. So we have that we have them to um, thank for that. Richard Arkwright Jr. Uh, did very well for himself. He married. He had a large family, and um, he sort of distributed his wealth to his children by buying them country estates around England. <clears throat> and from that point onwards, it doesn't seem that anybody else in the family had the same ambition and the fortunes gradually diminished after that. So I think most of the properties have been lost now and bought by other people. So we still have connection with some of his descendants come to Cromford occasionally to see us. Uh, there's one in particular that lives in uh, New Zealand, one of his descendants that keeps going backwards, backwards and forwards to Cromford to see us. So they're still around, but uh, they don't have the fortune anymore. Is there a connection with the hurts of in, um, yes. um, Charles Hurt that lives there now is um, one of the, I think he's um, vice president of the Arkwright Society. Yes. Um, it's the same family. The, the building at Caston Hall was where I think the family put the second sons. So they were based mainly at Uh So Caston was the, the, the second part of the the second son of the family was given that property. Um, but that goes way that goes way back to Roman times, that building. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Cobb's quite um, bulky, but I think it's your form is it's wonderful. How did they get to and from, from the factory? It's uh, it came by pack horse. Um, the roads at the time were virtually non existent. Yeah, well the tour guide say it's from Liverpool. Now, I've never looked into this personally, so I, I, I'm only saying what I've heard. <clears throat> well, we're told by the tour guides when they speak to people that came from Liverpool by Packles, which is quite a long journey. So he, he must have had good reasons to come to Cromford rather than set up in Lancashire closer to the, uh, the source of the cotton. Um, in later years, um, a canal was built uh, by Richard Arkwright and others and they were able to use that to ship out the cotton. It was mainly built for the um, mineral industry, <clears throat> but they used that. Uh, and then after that, a railway was built. Um, Richard Arkwright did improve the road somewhat because when he built the mills, he built over the local bridge that crossed the stream. So he took over and put a wall around the site and cut off the local road. So he had to create a new road to Matlock. And he did that by blasting through a great limestone rock. So he did improve the road somewhat, but it's still coming by pack horse. And did he leave by pack horse? As far as I know, yes. Um, the gateways on site were certainly big enough to take a horse and cart at least. But I don't know that we have any records that um, show how it did, how it was transported. Um, as was said earlier, all the records from the time have been lost in fires. Um, the cotton mills seem to burn down regularly, and uh, there's very little survival that tells us exactly what went on. I came across some things in Derbyshire Record Office about transport um, for Cromford. Some of the, some of the only things that, that were there, but that was sort of act of parliament and things to, to grant him permission to um, build the canal and, and things like that. Um, there are a few 
few things, what, what, as you say, just so much was lost. So much was lost. Um, it may be one of the reasons why they didn't continue using crumb for very long. By the uh, so the 1830s, 1840s, cotton production of crumb had just about ceased. Um, Arkwright didn't reinvest, and Richard, Richard Jr. didn't reinvest in the early mill because they got bigger mills elsewhere, really. <clears throat> so it just stayed very much as it was at the time. So transport may have been part of that, I guess, because it is quite an awkward place to get to. The back were well established though, across from the, yes. the, uh, the west of the, of the moors. Yes, and Cromford was originally a crossing place on the river, so there was always a route through, um, coming down off the White Peak and across that way. And then there's another route that goes down to Dunham. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know where the canal was built. Can you remember, Sasha, what, did you notice what year it was? I think it was late 1700s. Yeah. Awesome. Some interesting things there. If you're only interested in research and transport, so, I think you'd like late 1700s. Yeah. I don't know, 80s, 80s. The railway was probably too late to be used for the mill, I think. I think that was much later. After Arkwright, what are the possible reasons for seizing that uh, either the spinning mill or the cotton industry, whatever way you. Uh, have you got any uh, answer for seizing or that? Um, well, um, Cromford in particular, it just became outdated. Um, for the mill there, it was powered by quite a small water wheel, um, and the source of the water was actually lost. Richard Arkwright fell out with the lead miners, and uh, they dug another stuff into their lead mines and took the water elsewhere. So there's not nearly as much water coming through the site as there used to be. So that's one reason why Cromford ran down. <clears throat> they could have put a steam engine in later on, but decided not to because they had bigger mills elsewhere. Um, really, the um, cotton industry in the Mellor Derwent Valley um, didn't grow in the same way as it did in Lancashire. Uh, when all the mills grew up in Lancashire, there was no reason really to come to, to Cromford and to Belper and the other mills in the lower valley. So I think it just became, it's just that uh, Lancashire took over so much, um, nobody reinvested in the mills that were in Cromford and Belper. Right, because of that competition, they can't beat anyone with that other part. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Arkwright's mills and system were copied widely, yeah. including uh, in Scotland, New Lanark, <coughs> in Germany at Cromford, they called it after the same name, and in America as well. Um, so the same system actually spread very widely around the uh, around the different countries of Europe and into North America at the time. So everywhere there was production like that tended to be on a bigger scale than it had started out in the lower Valley. But after a while, that steam power uh, that got into the system, that's yes. why that, oh, yes. that different uh, that for shape and size, so that that older firm needed. Yes, yeah. Once they started using steel, there was no limit on what they could do, really. Thank you. 